If one comes to Krishna consciousness somehow or other, even for material gain, the result is that he will be liberated. Kama, dvesha, bayat, snehat. Whether for the satisfaction of material desires, because of the influence of envy, because of fear, because of affection, or because of any other reason, if one comes to Krishna, his life is successful. Om again, Chiranandha Sian. Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Ram Hare. Is quite confident about the bhakti process. Uh, sometimes devotees wonder. People, as you heard, are obsessed with material desires. And sometimes such persons approach Krishna. Is there any hope for them? Uh, and other times it's pointed out that even persons who take up the bhakti process uh, who seem after some time to succumb to uh, material desires. So who is going to be standing at the end of the race? The end of the race does come. That means the end of the spot. Srila Prabhupada is imparting the same confidence that Srila Bhagavatam imparts. Even if you are obsessed with material desires, if you properly take to the bhakti cure, you'll make spiritual advancement. So then we have to transfer our doubts from the bhakti process to our uh, application of the bhakti process. Again and again, in Srimad Bhagavatam, it is stated that even if you are full of material desires, which the Bhagavatam will really tell you is not a sign of intelligence, <laughs> if you are afflicted in that way, still approach Krishna. Tivrena bhakti yogena. Engage in Krishna's service with the intensity of a, of a sun ray. Uh, and that way, uh, you can uh, attain all the best in spiritual existence. So, the Bhagavatam is making it clear <laughs> that the bhakti process is not afraid at all to handle persons overloaded with material desires. It points out the futility of those desires. We heard uh, some days ago, the definition of kama, lust, uh, a quite a revealing definition. Kama means desires, lusts, which will never be fulfilled. Any material desire will never be fulfilled. Uh, you'll get a little hope of fulfillment. You may get a little glimmer of fulfillment, <laughs> but that's all. That Kama situation, that lust situation, characterizes <laughs> living entities in this world. How will they ever escape <coughs> such bondage? There's no need for us to feel hopeless. If the bhakti process is properly administered, and if the candidates to bhakti properly accept guidance, they can traverse all the dangers of the material world. We shouldn't lose confidence. We shouldn't lose our perspective. The hospital can cure disease. The Bhakti hospital can take care of its patients. What's happening in the heart, uh, as pointed out in Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita, is that there are two things there. The propensity to serve Krishna and the propensity for material enjoyment. Those two things are there in the heart because we are Tatasta Shakti, the marginal potency of the Supreme Lord. Just like the beach is sometimes covered by the waves and sometimes not. So similarly, the marginal potency of the Supreme Lord can go either way, toward Krishna or toward material enjoyment. So within the heart, is the uh, propensity to serve Krishna. And when you take seriously to the process of bhakti and receive initiation, you are being formally endowed with the bhakti lata bij, the seed of 
the creature of Bhakti, which if watered properly by hearing and chanting about Krishna, that seed will grow to a luxurious creeper. But as we know, you have to be careful of the weeds. Weeding a garden, that's part of gardening. <laughs> so we shouldn't be intimidated that the bhakti process requires weeding. <laughs> you want to grow food in your backyard or whatever, you have to deal with weeds one way or another uh, to protect the uh, uh, plants that you're trying to favor. So certainly the bhakti process requires weeding. When we become inattentive to weeding, Due to bad association, due to laziness, uh, due to some doubts that have been speculated by our mind, uh, then the garden becomes overwhelmed by the weeds. Just a little inattentiveness. You know, if you're a gardener, you take care of your garden, you go away for a week or two, you come back and uh, the weeds are up. Uh, you have to do the necessary. So it's the same. Uh, with the bhakti process. Along with that tendency to serve Krishna in the heart, which can mm, uh, become the bhakti lata bij, the seed of the creeper of devotion, there's also the seed of material enjoyment. So we have to be honest and practical and not live in, as they used to say, la la la. <laughs> that, that seed is there. So what are you going to do about it? There's no point in becoming intimidated and pulling your hair and moaning and groaning. You take up a practical, uh, proactive program to deal with the seed of material enjoyment in the heart. The Panchatattva specialized in frying that seed or making that seed uh, uh, unable to sprout. Shri Krishna's Kavira, as Swami describes in Chaitanya Charitamrita, that the more the Panchatattva dance, the more the flood of love of Krishna increases. And the more the flood of love of Krishna increases, all the seeds of material enjoyment uh, become unable to sprout. In short, the more that Krishna consciousness is distributed, the more the desire for material enjoyment in society goes down. This is the only solution, individually and collectively. The more the chanting of Hare Krishna spreads, the more people have a chance to connect with Krishna, the more, on a mass level, the seed of material enjoyment is reduced. Now, we may not have the vision to see that right away. We shouldn't be so attached to what we can perceive right away. Uh, it may take some mm, higher viewpoint about to actually see what's going on, or it may take uh, longer time. In uh, Shilabhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's time, when he sent a few disciples to London uh, to try and spread the bhakti process. He told them, be prepared not to see the results of your efforts for a hundred years. <laughs> so, uh, to see how the bhakti process is working in terms of uh, mass influence, uh, it takes some special vision. But that special vision uh, is given by the Panchatattva. Uh, they want you to see, both on the individual level and on the mass level, how Krishna consciousness is doing things. But you have to follow in their footsteps, and then they impart the vision to you. That is one of the benefits of those who seek to take up Lord Chaitanya's order wherever you go, whomever you meet teach them the science of Krishna. You must teach them the science of Krishna somehow or other. Krishna Tattva. Uh, one who attempts to do that, taking up the order of Lord Chaitanya, gets that benefit of vision to see what's happening uh, in individuals' hearts and in society. Uh, 
I always quote a very interesting definition of management that Sri Prabhupada gave. It's quite, uh, you might say, counterintuitive to our material conditioning. He said, management means to make arrangements that create an interest in Krishna amongst persons who think they're not interested in Krishna. That's management. Very extraordinary definition. And elsewhere in Chaitanya Charitamrita, uh, Srila Prabhupada writes that this Krishna consciousness uh, movement is meant to attract all types of persons, even those mm, who think they have no interest in Krishna or those who are overburdened with material desires. This Krishna consciousness is meant to deal with them. And how? are those persons dealt with. By association with devotees, such persons gradually become purified and relinquish, forget about their material desires. So the important ingredient in the purifying process is the association of devotees. But then there have to be devotees who are powerful enough to be cleansing agents. And this is what Shuman Bhagavatam is presenting the power of devotees for being cleansing agents, uh, both in their individual contacts and in the world. To be conditioned by material nature means to be subjected to the repetition of birth and death. You get used to it, repeated birth and death, because we are conditioned. We start taking birth, death, disease, and old age as natural. What can you do about it? Uh, we resign ourselves. Uh, but actually, it's a totally unnatural, artificial situation. But due to so much association with material nature, we just take the movements of time, deterioration, and the temporariness. We just take it as life. That's the way it is. This is a sign of our conditioning. This feeling of resignation. What can you do about it anyway? You might as well just try and squeeze out whatever little momentary pleasure you can. I mean, you know. <laughs> we didn't make the world this way. What do, you, what do you expect, you know? Don't blame me. I'm just trying to do the best I can, you know. Trying to cope. <laughs> so that... Resignation is nothing noble. In fact, it's uh, the opposite of noble. Mm. It's a sign of conditioning. We've been worked over and pounded to such a degree that we just, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Sweet. Sweet. <laughs> I don't know, you don't know. <laughs> hey, is there a, a, a drop of temporary pleasure somewhere? Can you help me out? <laughs> Brother, can you show me where a drop of temporary pleasure is? <laughs> You're my friend if you can do that. Uh, maybe we should get together and be a couple. I mean, after all, you showed me a drop of temporary pleasure. <laughs> this is how uh, mad we are just for the tiniest bit of satisfaction. So we're easily bought off. It's embarrassing to notice how easily bought off we are. <laughs> like I was describing yesterday, uh, talking to uh, one of my brothers, and he was, you remember, he was. We had a really great month last last month. You know, so many cars were sold. Yeah, the economy looks like it's picking up. All that needs to happen is that the you know the financial system in Europe doesn't collapse and we'll be okay. Now that's a big if. <laughs> this is madness. <laughs> this is no security. <laughs> this is not peacefulness. <laughs> so I say, I had a good. I really had a good week last week, and last weekend was super special. Now all that needs to happen is tomorrow no one blows my head off. And then we're going to be big <laughs> <laughs> That's a big hit because of the high probability that someone will blow my head off tomorrow. But anyway, <laughs> this is conditioning. <laughs> and we're so dull, we don't see it that way. <laughs> we just say these things matter of fact, you know, matter of factly. 
The body process deconditions you. It makes you aware. And to do that requires potent association of bhakti yogis. So that uh, living beings are snapped out of this dullness, this state of resignation. Uh, what can you do about it? Or else they just live in denial. I don't see any problems, do you? Everything's just beautiful. <laughs> just see everything as beautiful, and, and it is all beautiful. And then we talked before about the defiant ones. I don't care that it's meaningless. I don't care that it's all absurd. I'm going to get what I want anyway. <laughs> I'm going to get the money. I'm going to get the prestige. I'm going to please my senses. I don't care that it's all just a, a, a total absurdity and nothing makes sense. I'll do my life as I want, and that's the meaning. This, these are all different types of conditioning. There's no doubt the bhakti process can handle all that. The seed of material enjoyment can be dealt with. But we have to be very serious about it. It's an occupation dealing with the seed of material enjoyment. So the question is, how much value do you give to yourself? Do you think you're worth it to deal with the seed of material enjoyment? Do you actually think it's worthwhile to invest in yourself? Do you think it's worth dedicating a short lifetime for dealing with this uh, seed of material enjoyment, as well as your propensity to be attracted to Krishna? Are you worth it? Do you see yourself as worth it? This is the question uh, that we all have to face. Because everything requires some kind of price in terms of effort, in terms of concentration. Material life requires a price. Uh, it requires effort, sacrifice. Uh, uh, I was talking to another, another of my brothers. He was in med school. He got married when he was in med school. And he was in his, doing his intern, internship, which means uh, he's even worse than med school. He just had no time for anyone or anything. But he got married at that time. And uh, I was visiting him, this was maybe, I don't know, 30 years ago. I was visiting him, and, uh, and uh, he was never around when I was passing through town. And, but, but his wife was always there, and she was always crying. Oh, I can't take it anymore. Oh, I never see her. This is not my daddy at all. I got, you know, I was just, that was a promise. <laughs> I knew I knew I, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> so uh, now, de decades later, he's well established and all that. And so when I, whenever I remind his wife about that, what? What are you talking about? I remember that. <laughs> you know, the success becomes so intoxicating. You just rewrite history. Oh, everything's always been fine. You know, we okay. We went through a little bit of uh, you know austerity while he was doing his internship. I, but I don't remember all these breakdowns you're talking about. <laughs> and you wonder why we can't even remember. You wonder why we can't remember our past birth or our past death. We can't even remember the traumas that happened in, in, in this lifetime. All the uh, struggles we went through. We're so proud. <laughs> well, nothing ever happened. <laughs> Everything was always fine. <laughs> oh, you got here and there. Everything was fine. What are you talking about? You know, I've got my, I've got my big house. You know, I've got two cars and you know, two point four children and all that. <laughs> and for how long is everything fine? You just get a semblance that everything is fine. It's going to work out. And when the end comes, we don't know. I mean, we don't want to think about that. I was talking to one uh, former uh, pillar of New York, uh, Urjaswap Prabhu, and uh, he was telling me uh, how you know, he had a stroke and how it came over him about four years ago. He was at the Tucson temple, and he was chanting Jai Radha Madhava. 
of a sudden, the village I got him out of it, he just froze. And he, he doesn't remember what happened. He was told. He was just like that. And so the devotees just sat there watching, like, wow. Yeah, this could be some deep ecstatic trance. Seeing Jairama, Radhamada, maybe this Prabhu might be really way up there. Who no, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> They just watched while he sat emotionless, you know, with his eyes fluttering, pretending. Sudhamani Mataji, she was in the kitchen hearing the, hearing the class over the loudspeaker. And so she's wondering, it's been 10 minutes now, he hasn't said anything. What's going on? And so she, you know, she ran into the temple room. She just saw him just frozen there with the cartels in his hand, his eyes fluttering, and everyone just watching like, wow, this is a deep, uh, deep bhava. Uh, and she just, you know, yelled in his ear, just my Prabhu, just my Prabhu, and no answer. So immediately she called 911 and, you know, took him to the hospital and, <clears throat> He just remembers waking up in the hospital. Uh, Everything's dark around him, and there's a man, a, 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 a you know, doctor or a nurse, looking in his face, you know, mouthing words, and, and so he's trying to understand. You had a stroke. Oh, <laughs> had a stroke. <laughs> and they're just like, we were saying, trying to figure out what, what's he talking about. <laughs> he didn't understand, and he and he urged Robert who couldn't. He he couldn't. Uh, he couldn't talk because of the effects of the stroke. All he could do was chant Hare Krishna. He couldn't say anything else. So he just started chanting Hare Krishna. But these, this, at this hospital, they, they, they knew nothing about the Maha Mantra. So they thought he was gone crazy. They thought he was lost his mind. He wasn't speaking English. And no matter what they asked him, just Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And they all went So he, he didn't know what to do. He I never felt so more helpless in my life. Oh, I couldn't speak. Mm -hmm. I couldn't enunciate. I couldn't say who I am or how I feel. All I could do was just chant Hare Krishna. And they couldn't understand. What is this Hare Krishna? <laughs> so you heard him talking. He might have snapped during the stroke and just a mental breakdown. <laughs> so finally, someone uh, came from the, the temple and told the medical staff, you know, this is the Hare Krishna mantra. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the fact that he's able to chant like that's a very good sign. So, uh, we don't know when our last moment is going to be there, but we're so convinced I'm going to be around long enough to get my share of material design. Why? Because material nature owes that to me. Why? Because when I'm here, <laughs> why? Okay, why would God put me here if he didn't want to give me something? <laughs> what am I doing here? <laughs> Mitchell Asia owes me a good time. I know there'll be a few problems, but at the same time, obviously, there'll be a chance for fulfillment. <laughs> if I just work hard enough, if I just associate with the right people, if I just get a few breaks, <laughs> it'll be there for me. There's nothing innocent about that mentality. This is being obsessed with material desires. And those desires will never be fulfilled. Yet, all such persons have complete hope in the bhakti process. But we have to apply that process very thoroughly if you expect a thorough cleansing. Obviously, not everyone is going to take up that thorough cleansing. Uh, Shri Prabhupada gave his uh, his reasons why he was mm, opening the doors to uh, anyone who wanted to take up the process of bhakti, even though it was known that in the future they would go away. He said, I'm doing this on the authority of Narada Muni, who said, better they come to bhakti and give it up than not to come at all. But at the same time, uh, we need to make our, um, our centers such that they're demonstrating persons of ideal character, ideal qualities. Uh, so there needs to be obviously some juggling. We're open to everyone, 
but at the same time, we have a core responsibility to prepare a class of persons who have an ideal character. And it's those persons who are the cleansing agents. So it seems we're doing two things at once. Our doors are open, we're distributing the holy name, we're inviting everyone, please contact the Bhakti process. At the same time, our doors are a little closed <laughs> in terms of uh, the core, because uh, it's the core that will carry the ball, so to speak, in terms of demonstrating uh, ideal character. Remember yesterday we spoke about Joe Prabhupada's analysis, particularly of America. Uh, they got off the deep end by being attracted to material progress rather than developing persons of ideal qualities. So, and then he went on to describe that he expected the Krishna conscious society to be able to present to the world, and particularly to America, uh, persons of ideal quality. And if such, I, if such devotees of ideal quality are listened to, uh, the whole country can change and actually then give proper leadership to the whole world. So we're doing two things at once. And obviously that requires management and organization and proper vision. We have a two-pronged approach. We're open, and at the same time, we have to keep our core pure and healthy. And not everyone's able to uh, maintain a proper standard of purity and ideal character. They are able, but they may not want to. So therefore, this constant juggling is there. We're open, and again, we have to make sure that the core is <coughs> purified and demonstrating ideal quality. So it's a simultaneous being liberal and being conservative at the same time. Uh, it's very interesting uh, and very fascinating uh, situation how it is that bhakti manifests in this world. The goal is to be as free as Krishna. That's what Krishna wants. You'll hear in the verses that are coming up, uh, what is victory for Krishna? When you become as free from material nature as Krishna is, that may seem impossible. But in Krishna's eyes, it's completely possible for you. That's the real meaning of yoga. Krishna is the master of yoga, meaning he can appear in the material world and not be touched at all by material contamination. And he wants to teach his parts and parcels the same ability, how to live in material nature without being touched by material nature. That's being as free as Krishna. We'll stop here and ask any questions. Yes. <clears throat> Maharaj, thank you very much for another very enlightening class. And uh, you mentioned both yesterday and today it touched upon the a uh, very important point that uh, that of developing ideal character and I just wanted to ask you because you said that um, you know in Krishna consciousness we are ultimately we want to become as free as Krishna and we want to protect ourselves we're following these four regulated principles it's a very strict program how many people in society are even following one or two of them, what to speak of fully engaged in Krishna's service. Um, is there any scope um, for developing uh, along the lines of an ashram where we can actually get to the point to manage society where we're not only just focusing on developing a Brahminical class, but <clears throat> being able to, uh, you know, mercifully help those people who aren't even attracted uh, at any level of Krishna consciousness to somehow take up the process. Anything in that regard you'd like to share? Any realizations? What do you mean by not attracted at all to take up the process? I mean because of, um, 
you know, there's, there's many people that will uh, look at Krishna consciousness and see that uh, it's, you know, what they're doing is very impractical because of their own stereotyped ideas of, of religion, for example. They see us in, in our robes and things and they, they uh, you know, have no attraction because they don't, they don't yes. really understand what we're doing. I'm getting on the plane tonight to a place where the whole country thinks like that. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, you know, where people are coming to Krishna consciousness, they're just reading all those books, they're just doing it. So, uh, let me just read for because we don't go too long. Uh, mm, say that there's no doubt Srila Prabhupada wanted Varnashram Dharma as a way to engage people uh, properly according to their material propensity. Uh, and you're going to hear in the coming verses where he says that the devotee wants to establish Varnashadharma because it's what Krishna wants. <laughs> That's the main reason. <laughs> At the same time, we have to make sure that before we get to the second half of the movement, we have the first half. And that keeping the first half is, takes a lot of energy. So it's not that uh, we are we so much forgetting the second half. It's just we are, we've seen that just to maintain the first half uh, is taking so much of our concentration. This, okay, let's give an example of Ukraine. There are 8,000 devotees in Ukraine. If you if you talk to the main two leaders of Ukraine, Chutu Priya, Purple and Naranjan, and so on, they'll tell you just to keep the first half of the movement intact takes so much of their time and effort and to keep deviations out, to keep everyone focused on the holy name, to tend to everyone's spiritual needs. They, like, they have no capacity. They're, they're maxed out. <laughs> it doesn't mean that they uh, think it's impossible forever to have Varnash and Dharma, but they're acting according to their strength. <laughs> they're keeping, their, uh, keeping the future options open, but based on what they can do as servants of Srila Prabhupada now, what they have to handle now, they are maxed out. <laughs> so please keep that in mind. We have to uh, deal with the first half of the movement. <laughs> and in many places, the first half needs to be shored up. Yes, Archa Thank you very much, Maharaj. Just a brief note, something that he said, and also to ask him. So I'll ask you first. A quote about management. Do you remember exactly or approximately where it is? Because I couldn't find out. I, I don't remember where it yeah. was, but it, One it always things. stuck out in my mind. I never forgot. Uh, as far as the Maharashtra goes, uh, we have to balance that with uh, Lord Chaitanya's statement of Stani Stita. I mean, Lord Prabhupada's first, but Lord Chaitanya accepted that stay in your position. In other words, again, if we want farmers, rather than trying to get city boys to become farmers, go into the farmland and preach to the farmers and make them devotees. So now they're still farmers and they start chanting Hare Krishna. That's basically how Varnashram is going to be created. You cannot take city folk and make them into farmers, which is what Varnashram is based on. It's based on an agrarian lifestyle. You cannot take guys from you know, downtown LA and turn them into farmers. It's not going to work. Unless there's no other choice. <laughs> 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 yes, uh, Tejas Prabhu, our, our guy from the Tejas Prabhu, told us how Prabhupada took him aside told him several times, I want to call all the GBCs to India, and we're going to go from village to village starting the farmer's movement. <laughs> so this is how big Shula Prabhupada's vision was. Uh, we have to be practical about what we can do, uh, while keeping our eyes open for all that Shula Prabhupada wanted. At the same time, we have to make sure that at least the core is there. Without the core, we're finished. <laughs> all right.